Hello everyone, my name is Federico, I work in Charles Department of Chemistry in Alberta. I work in the group of Professor Pat and Ectical. We work on several materials from mostly the chemistry perspective. We work on B-dimensional material, mesoporous materials, which are materials which porosity is commensurate to the size of molecules, basically. We work on chemistry of coordination metals in the terms of branding frameworks. And we studied most of these materials with the idea of targeting new catalytic applications. It's a quite international group. So actually, all our students are from China. And there are four postdocs from England, Germany, Slovakia, and Italy. Uh, this was the last recent uh, retreat we did with our group. I'm not there because we took the picture. We took quite a picture with me. It didn't go out well. And uh, so a bit of, of an overlook about my talk would be a bit different. It's very broad. It's not, there's not, nothing very specific. And it's divided most in three parts. I will introduce something about material science and computational methods for material science. I move on to density functional theory. We already got plenty of discussion yesterday, so I won't spend much time in details. And then I have some final, let's say, pedagogical points about how computers can change and reshape research, and I will show some example about that. So let's start from material science. It is something that also happens here most of the time when you introduce yourself as a material scientist, people assume you're an engineer, or a physicist, or a chemist, something else. Uh, Material science is a field that is very broad and is a, a typical multidisciplinary science. The topic is basically to work on anything in the solid state. So any material is our topic, of, is our interest, right? And the, I think the peculiarity of here, which is something you find in other fields as well, like nanotechnology, which is part of material science, is that you can study the elements, the, constitu the constituents <laughs> of materials, and this is kind of a chemical physics approach. You can study the material itself, like object. You can study the nanostructure. But you can also do something more engineering-like. So for example, you can design which is the best material for a given application. You can study the you know, thermal behavior of material for different environments, uh, how, how material reacts to different environments. And you can also study processes to produce material, engineering material, and so on and so forth. In the last, I would say, maybe 30 years, material science was able to power the biggest or some of the biggest technological improvement in, in science and application. Let's think about high density storage memories, for example, or new processor, or nanomaterials, or other type of applications that actually were not available. Uh, and I was mentioning that, yeah, material science is quite broad. And what I'm doing, then, I'm working on everything, of course not. For me, material science is basically the joining point, or the part of material science I work with is the joint, is the joining point between physics and chemistry. Um, so you have to realize something that is quite of an historical perspective. Uh, for basically many centuries, we've mostly done, let's say, chemistry, and we developed a lot of recipes to do materials. So when physics arrived in the beginning of the uh, 20th century to develop a lot of theories, uh, we don't have to underestimate the fact that we've got a lot of chemical intuition or, you say, practice to produce materials that were just predicted uh, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, what characterized my research or this type of material search, I would say, is actually this interplay between chemistry and physics. Uh, the fact that we mostly have an atomistic perspective. So we're trying to describe the single individual atom or molecule or cluster of atoms. And the, the methodology I or people in my field use mostly is computer simulation. So now we do, <laughs> I do a kind of, a, again, a kind of an historical perspective. So up to the years of Galileo, before we start to develop the scientific method, most of the things we did before was trial and error without much logic. We discovered that if you mix uh, water and flour, you get bread dough, that if you cook the bread dough, you get bread. Uh, we discovered how to, unfortunately, to build weapons, and so on and so forth. Then, let's say, with the scientific, the first scientific revolution, we started to, like, a sort of psychological evol evolution, we started to say, well, we can actually use math to model the science, the nature, and we start to build theories. And for many years, uh, were well, basically up to, let's say, the 20s or the 40s, uh, most of 
the signs were somehow divided between experimental signs and theoretical signs. And there were some more somehow communicating between them. And then what happened, I think, there was a slow transition between the 30s and the 60s, I would say, where theoreticians were also doing, basically were also doing simulations. They were actually putting <coughs> numbers into equation and try to see their results. At the beginning, this was done in a mechanical way. Uh, there was a time where crunching numbers was literally me that got mechanical apparatus that were solving equation, metrics, and so on. So when computers started uh, to be more and more present in every day, you know, I think this evolved as a new branch, uh, something I like to call meta experiment, because somehow you are, you know, doing some in silico experiment. And the reason why we do that is because science grew a lot. We cannot afford anymore to do trial and error kind of approach to science because there are too many stuff to do basically. And also sometimes we want to do things that are unsafe or dangerous or impossible. We can simulate temperatures that are not feasible. Uh, I would say most of the time it's because we want to save money. Uh, but you know you can also work a lot theoretically with uranium and then just take all the precaution to do something experimentally. So how this, how this model of simulation happened in material science? Uh, I think this is not a psychological or like an intuition that we have. The, the truth is that we develop computer and the computer power, this is a logarithmic scale, grow exponentially. There, I'm kind of cheating here, this is not the most up to date and there are some discussion, more theoretical discussion about how computers are going to evolve in the next years or how they are. But the, I think the message here, so this is the chart, this chart here is the top 500 supercomputers in the world in the last 20 something years. So the, the, the yellow line is the slowest of the top 500, purple one is the sum, and the middle one is the top supercomputer. Because this growth is exponential, and I, in the last part I comment on this, basically there was a technological pressure to change the way we do research, especially how we do modeling. And I'd like to evolve, uh, to basically point out kind of an evolution, so I put Pokemon here, uh, how the, how we computer thing that actually changes. So let's say in the 20s, 30s, people were developing the first quantum theories with single atoms, very simple materials, diamond, copper, and so on and so forth. Uh, and they do some easy software that were basically solving some equation and they were doing some back on the end of calculation and that was it. This is up to, they, that's actually when they actually uh, predicted the existence of graphene in the, in the 50s. They were just doing some simple math, you can do a math on paper. And um, then we were able with computer to generalize this approach. So nowadays, if you give me a material with the extension of the theory I'm using, I can actually predict the properties of that material. The thing is computer grows so fast and nowadays we get words that now became popular like data mining, and artificial intelligence, neural network, and we are slowly changing the approach. So rather than calculating the property of the material, so selecting, a, which is the same if you want uh, experimental procedure where you give me some material, I give you properties. That would be the other way around. You want the material with the specific properties and we design a material with such properties. And this is a huge change in the approach of the things. And this is happening in many other fields, so I think I will again comment on this expert later. So, but if we go back to nowadays, or uh, we stay in nowadays time, I start in the second part. So, I mentioned that today we can calculate properties. Uh, with computers, actually, you can select the object you want to study from macro scale work, like, I don't know, the weather forecast, an airplane, to the single atom uh, environment, and you have you basically have a set of computer applications or theories that you can apply at different scales. This is just a picture of that. Myself, I work mostly in this part of the chart, so we work in things in the domain of Angstrom, so fraction of nanometers, and in time scale that are close between the femto and the nanoseconds. The characteristic of material that we have here is that the physics that regulates them is, is, is quantum mechanics, basically. And so, for respect to the audience, I change our equations, and uh, I think we need just very few simple concepts here. The first concept is properties of everything around you depends basically on the electrons. Okay, nuclei are not that important. 
fields are important but only when you use them. But what you have to understand is the electrons are dictating most of the behavior of the stuff around you. Uh, and the second thing very important if you want to solve this type of equation is that they are not hard small spheres, they are quantum objects, so they behave as waves. So this is the Schrodinger equation, or one version of that, which is a wave equation. And we want to solve that. So just to show a nice picture, this is a, a pictorial representation of, of how an electro behaves in a, this is I think it's a cold crystal. And without knowing the math, I just want to point out if you have a system with n atoms or m electrons, you have all these electrons, each one has at least three variables, which are the spatial distribution of the electrons, x, y, z. But you know, I think everyone knows electrons have spin, so the variable is actually 6n. Uh, and to be completely uh, correct, you don't want to study each electron individually, you want to see if they interact each other. And you want to obtain the final global wave function. So that means that this number of variables can be combined in different ways. You have to figure out. This is not even an exponential problem. It's a factorial complexity problem, which means that basically most of the times you cannot solve it because it's too large. So the message behind density functional theory, as the name suggests, is to say, well, we can really study the wave function of electrons. So we simplify a bit. We take the charge density, so how the electron charge is distributed over space. This allows us to move from a multi-configurational space bit, basically to a three-variable or three-dimensional space. So what I'm saying here, wave functions are very difficult. But there is a trick, which is studying a macroscopic properties called density, which is how charges into space, and that is easier, basically. The beauty of that is there are some methods that once you obtain, when, once you can calculate the density of a system, you can somehow go back to the individual electron description, and that basically allows you to recover with some assumption the properties you are actually interested in. So nowadays, the DFT is one of the most published topics, at least in chemistry and solid state physics. You can study up to thousands of atoms. We are still far away from proteins for people that work in the field. Uh, but there are some tricks to do that. Uh, we have different theories we can use to describe specific materials. <coughs> and we can do some cross-checking experimental data, mostly because the density is uh, observable. So we can actually kind of see that. We saw actually in the last talk that they show the charge density of the electrons. So what we do with that? I show you just a very popular example, the highest sample materials in the last five years, maybe after nanotubes. For who doesn't know chemistry, very simple material. There is a cage made of octahedra. These octahedra are rigid and they can rotate and they can form different patterns. In the middle, there is a molecule that does basically what hell it wants. So it moves, it rattles, does a lot of stuff. This material uh, is very sensible to temperature, humidity, and to, to be observed, for example. And if you want to do some characterization, it's actually very challenging. But if you want to do some simulation, that's much easier. So here, uh, our graphic is quite poor. But the message is we consider three different phases. Phases, in this case, I mean different orientation of these uh, cages. And we can predict uh, infrared spectroscopy, which is something that everyone is familiar with in biology. Uh, we can predict Raman spectroscopy. Here, you can't appreciate well. But we also compare that with the first experimental data. The beauty of doing computation when, when it works, you have some disagreement for sure. But when you have an agreement or when you have a good enough description, you can observe things that you cannot see experimentally. For example, if you have a dimensional mode in a molecule, you, you know more or less what is moving and how it's moving. But when you go in solid, that's much more complex and experimental. You can't have access to such information. But if you do a simulation because you design the rules of the game, you can actually see that. Or you can have, this is called, this is a technical aspect, is the phononic density of state, something that is more difficult to resolve into experiments because you need some like angle dependency that you can't usually observe. So this is just an example of what you can do, just to prove that sometimes we do simulations that are not completely detached, this is, this is the dispersion of the vibration, this is the nice parameter, but this at the time was surprising because we were able to, to simulate the volumetric expansion, so mechanical properties, and the dot here, the star here, is the actual experimental data with the first one available, and it seems that our theory was able to describe this number, which is a very, you know, sometimes theory is a bit abstract. This is a very clear quantity you can 
measure, you go to the lab, you take some measurement, you have an error, and then you move on. So I won't annoy you with other results. I want to go to some final part. I tried to show you the message of, at least of the first part, is that there was a time where we decided to include theory. There was kind of a cultural revolution, and we developed theory, and science was born. And then there was a second step, where we actually got some technology that, that pushed our way of working on you know, the next step. So, I was assuming a broad general audience. Um, there is a psychological thing that our mind thinks in a linear scale. When you have exponential processes, you, this is actually the trend of the most basic uh, exponential uh, growth, and it's a massive fast process. Like, you basically don't see anything when you go to the 15th generation, you don't see nothing before. And this is basically unsustainable to most of the process, and this, un unless you change it. But again, we think in a linear, local way. We, we are not able to think in that way. We think that we go twice as fast, we get twice as much uh, space done. And in fact, when we plot this type of data, usually we use logarithmic scale, which is fine, it's great, everyone knows that, right? But this is some sort of cheating. Like, when you have this one, you have to realize that if you are living here, the quantity you're measuring, I don't know, radiation, I mean, you really, it's so large, there is no point in talking about that. Like, if there are real effect here, there is no effect here, or there are effect already here, here you're just burning everything. So it's some sort of important thing. Most of the time, working on such large scale is nonsense from a practical perspective. And I said before that exponential growth is some sort of not sustainable processes. And if you go especially in economy, it will be clear in a second. So for people that are more keen on math, when you have this, for example, economy process in exponential growth, it means that if you have a stepwise process that produces every time an exponential more quantity, <coughs> it means that every step, the quantity produces more of the sum of everything done in the past. So for example, if you take the computer power we have now, we have more computer power nowadays than we had summing all the past computer power. This is the thing, this is why our minds cannot catch up. We can do more now than we were able to do in time in all our history. Mathematical is this beautiful equation here, but I will skip this. And I was mentioning before these things about economy. Like if you go in the economy, it's well known, there are a lot of uh, economy, but other processes as well. I show you that when you have exponential growth, Usually there is a price that comes soon. This is the first speculation bubble, the tulip. Let's take that as an example. Let's not go into the details of that. It's also debatable. But you get the same thing for Bitcoins. Here I also cheated a bit. I didn't show because I think everyone here, at least someone lost some money. So let's not. Actually, they came back again. But this is an example of you have exponential growth and then you have a, 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 a dip <coughs> point where you stop to grow because you change so much the production or the system that you have problem. You get another example, which is more popular now here. So this is the concentration of <coughs> CO2, exponential growth. And here I want to show you, this is a popular uh, data set. If you see that, well, if people can argue that you start 180, you go 400, well, it's double, but maybe it's manageable. But if you take a different scale, you see that actually everything was pretty stable for thousands of years, and that there is a spike. So even when you plot data, especially exponential thing, the way you plot them is actually having a very important psychological effect on the message you want to convey. And I'll go back to the image I showed you before. Uh, computers are, with all the technological limits of the field, and actually, nowadays we are slowing down because we hit some physical art limit, uh, a technological growth. And especially in my field, there are a lot of jobs done by students that would be replaced by computers in the next maybe 30, 40 years. They estimate for global, general, global population, estimate 50% job less in the next 50 years. So there are three, part, three people. There are some people that are very pessimistic about this. I kind of lean towards that. There are people that are extremely positivist and say, well, that will not be just open new doors. Uh, Usually in units, and there is a you know, more average position, and we will see what happens. Uh, people, I think nowadays, they don't believe what computer can actually do because the development of computers is so fast that people cannot catch up with the things that are happening. I just want to point out something similar already happened many, many, many times in history. This is, was an inspiring feature shown to me by 
one CEO of the company. So this is a picture of New York, beginning of the 20th century. These are all horses powered at wagons, and there is one simple car. And if you, in this year, we were telling people that the engine was going to take over horses, people would say, nah, because we have a lot of people working, it's easy, you can feed them, they don't break down, if you kill a horse, you can still eat that, and so on and so forth. In 10 years, this is New York, there was the only engine-powered machines. So I just want to stress out that we are in a point of our civilization where things happen so fast that, yeah, maybe nothing happens, but you should be very aware because it's not a matter if it's going to happen. It's, it's a matter of when it's going to happen and how. So people should be very aware of that. Also, when you do teaching, students nowadays in university should be aware that their job will be basically replaced by machine. Most of their jobs, for sure. Uh, thanks for, for your attention. Thanks to Linus and Latte, you can use the paper for too many years. Slide is available here. Uh, thank you for attention and for people inviting.